When I first started pharma consulting, I was working in Germany, advising clients on how to get their local drug reimbursement. Back then, I've written a ton of unlocked dossiers myself, which is why today I want to share everything you need to know about benefit assessment in Germany. After watching this video, you'll know all about the unlock process, the components of the dossier, appropriate comparators, patient relevant endpoints, and the preferred types of analysis. You'll also learn about the quantification and the certainty of benefit ratings, key facts and outcomes 14 years after the introduction of AMNOC, and some elements of criticism of the German approach. As you may know, Germans love super long and difficult to pronounce words. The AMNOC or Arzneimittelmarkt Neuordnungsgesetz is really no exception to this rule. Translated into English, AMNOC stands for Pharmaceutical Market Restructuring Act, a law which was introduced in 2011 to tackle the fear of ever-increasing expenditures for patented drugs. Before we can dive into how this new law changed things, we first need to go back in time to understand how drug pricing was handled in Germany before 2011. Before AMNOC, Germany's drug pricing system was like the wild, wild west. Manufacturers could set whatever price they wanted and there was no sheriff in town to keep things in check. It was a free-for-all, kind of like Will Smith riding a giant mechanical spider into battle. It made for a great spectacle, but not exactly the most structured system. Then, in 2011, Amnok arrived, the new sheriff in town, bringing structure, price negotiations and, well, no more mechanical spiders. This represented the start for Germany to transition to an HDA-based system. To make this transition, Germany tasked three key players to get this job done. The first actor is the GBA, or Gemeinsamer Bundesausschuss, which translates to Federal Joint Committee. The GBA is the highest decision-making body in the German healthcare system, and it initiates and oversees the entire AMNOC benefit assessment process. The second key actor is the ICWIC, or Institut für Qualität und Wirtschaftlichkeit im Gesundheitswesen. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? ICWIC is the independent research institute which assesses the evidence from the drug companies. Third and last, the GKVSV represents the statutory health insurers in Germany. They are the ones who negotiate with the drug companies. Now that we know the players, let's have a look at how the AMNOC process works. It all kicks off with the dossier submission, whereby drug companies and manufacturers provide all relevant information to the GBA, and the GBA can then assign the ICWIC to assess the evidence submitted by the drug manufacturer, or alternatively, conduct the assessment themselves. Most of the time, ICWIC conducts the assessment, which then culminates in a report that gets sent back to the GBA. The ICWIC reports never only gives recommendations and is not binding for decision-making. The decision-making lies with the GBA, which considers the manufacturer's admission and the ICWIC report. Then, using this information, the GBA will decide if the new drug provides an additional benefit or not. If the new drug provides additional benefit, then the pharma company enters negotiations with the GKVSV. These negotiations can either result in an agreement, in which case a reimbursement price gets set, or alternatively, if there is no agreement between these parties, then an arbitration board is held, which brings an external facilitator to the table in the hope of reaching an agreement. If the negotiations still fail, there is the possibility for a cost-benefit assessment led by the ICWIC, which is not very common to the best of my knowledge. What about pricing though? You may have noticed that there is still an element of free pricing even with the AMNOC process. In fact, at market launch, drug companies can still set prices freely. This free pricing period used to be 12 months long, but it has recently been changed to only six months which means that the negotiated prices now start early and apply retroactively from month seven. The law that changed this was the GKV Finanzstabilisierungsgesetz, or Statutory Health Insurance Financial Stabilization Act. This act got introduced in 2022, and its aim was to toughen the negotiations using stricter criteria for what price can be achieved. As you can see, this act brought a set of decision rules that based on the level of added benefit, determine how much flexibility there is for drug pricing. Drugs with a no benefit rating, for example, now need to demonstrate an annual therapy cost at least 10% below the cost for the appropriate comparative therapy. 
Similarly, there are restrictions in place for drugs with a non-quantifiable or minor benefit, which caps the annual therapy costs of patented drugs to those of the appropriate comparator. Only drugs which achieve a considerable or major benefit rating have no restrictions on pricing. Achieving one of the two highest benefit categories is very difficult though, as you will see later on in this video. For now, let's shift our focus to what's actually included as part of the MNOC dossier. The dossier itself is thereby made up of five modules. Module one covers a summary of the MNOC dossier and the administrative information about the new product. It's generally very useful if you want to get a quick glance about the submission. Module two covers the mechanism of action of the new drug, as well as approved indications for the new intervention. Module three then includes information about the appropriate comparator, the number of patients with a therapeutically relevant additional benefit, and the cost of the therapy for the statutory health insurance. Now with module four, this is really where the meat is. It is where the study results are systematically presented by endpoint against the appropriate comparator. And it also describes the patient groups with relevant additional benefit. If you want to know how good the drug really is and what benefit rating it should get, then this is where you should look. Lastly, module five is a general collection of all the relevant attachments and appendices, like a list of the full text references, the clinical study report or statistical analysis plan. You may have noticed that I used the term appropriate comparator when speaking about module three and four, but what exactly makes a comparator appropriate? Well, turns out the GBA decides what qualifies as an appropriate comparator. The important thing here to note is that the appropriate comparator isn't necessarily the comparator that was chosen for the primary clinical trial. This can be neck breaking as you really don't want to find out last minute just before applying for your reimbursement that you don't have the right evidence, which is why it's so important to plan clinical trials with AMNOC already in mind. As per the GBA rules of procedure, the appropriate comparator has to be licensed in the therapeutic indication under evaluation and it has to reflect the current status of the medical knowledge. Also, there is a preference from the GBA to have an appropriate comparator which has already demonstrated a patient relevant benefit as per a previous GBA assessment. In cases where there's more than just one appropriate comparator, comparative evidence can be shown against one of those comparators, whereby the most economical option should be chosen for the cost comparison. Using the appropriate comparator as an anchor, comparative effectiveness is then assessed using what's called a patient relevant endpoint. In the German context, an endpoint is patient relevant if it captures how a patient feels, functions and survives. For each endpoint, you have to outline in module four of your AMNOC dossier why exactly this endpoint is patient relevant. Patient relevant endpoints can thereby cover a variety of outcomes, such as mortality, morbidity, health related quality of life or safety outcomes. In theory, surrogate endpoints can be considered as well for benefit assessment, but I can tell you from personal experience that the GBA really does not like a surrogate outcome and therefore is not a big fan of them and their use always requires detailed justification. Next, let's have a look at how patient relevant endpoints then are analyzed during the MNOC process. The type of effect measure is thereby dependent on the variable that's analyzed. So for example, binary variables tend to be assessed using risk ratios, odds ratios, and risk differences, while hazard ratios are preferred for time to event variables. Continuous variables, on the other hand, are evaluated either through responder analysis or standardized mean differences. For subgroup analysis, the deciding factor is whether or not they have been defined a priori. If subgroups have been planned prospectively, they should be reported for each endpoint, and some subgroup analysis may even be necessary due to German social law requirements. Another thing to know about the German HDA process is that it is not driven by cost effectiveness. While the ICWIC general methods technically mention the potential for cost effectiveness analysis, they are not really used in practice. The ICWIC general methods are also very particular about how meta-analysis should be conducted when there is more than one relevant clinical study. The methods thereby specify a preference for the Knapp-Hartung method using random effects, 
while sensitivity analysis should be done by running a fixed effect model. Lastly, the methods also speak to how indirect comparisons should be handled. In case indirect comparisons are necessary, Bucher ITC methods should be applied, while non-adjusted ITC methods are not recommended. Let's look at an example to see how these analysis methods are used to quantify the extent of benefit. What you can see in this table is the thresholds that apply to quantify the extent of benefit, and in this case, we're looking at the relative risk outcomes. ICWIC thereby uses the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval to assign either a major, considerable, or minor benefit. To get a benefit rating, the upper confidence interval limit must be smaller than the defined threshold value. You'll notice that these thresholds vary based on the outcome category. So for all cause mortality, these breakpoints are easier to achieve than for serious and non-serious symptoms. Presumably, this is done to reflect a certain value judgment, whereby developing treatments that impact patient survival is more difficult to do than developing treatments that only uh, target symptoms and hence the necessary effect demonstrated can be smaller for all cause mortality. Apart from the extent of benefit, the GBA also wants to know how certain the evidence is. What they came up with is what you can see in this table right here. As per the ICWIC general methods, there are three levels of certainty. The highest certainty level is the proof, followed by an indication, and lastly, a hint for an additional benefit. What level gets assigned thereby depends on the qualitative certainty of the results and the number of studies available. So for example, a meta-analysis with a statistically significant and also clinically meaningful common effect which also has a high qualitative certainty, would get you a proof for an additional benefit. Whereas the best you can get with a single study that has a significant effect is an indication for an additional benefit. If we combine the extent of benefit with the certainty of benefit, we get a matrix that looks something like this. For example, in our Amnoc dossier, we might argue that there is a proof for a minor benefit or an indication for a considerable benefit and so forth. What's interesting to see is how the additional benefit ratings are distributed across indications. That's what's shown on this graph. 14 years after the introduction of the AMNOC process, 62% of all drugs have received at least one additional benefit rating, which also includes non-quantifiable benefit ratings for orphan drug medications. What you can see is that it's really hard to achieve the highest benefit rating, represented via the dark green bars. You can also see that the cancer drugs have the highest proportion of at least one benefit rating, with over 50% receiving either a major, considerable or minor benefit. One thing to point out for this figure is that there are a small number of cases in which the new intervention got a rating that said that it was less effective than the existing therapy option. These cases are very rare, however, and I believe they might have been recorded as no additional benefit for this visualization. Moving on to speed to market, we can see that Germany is clearly leading the pack in the EU-wide comparison. The median time for new drugs to enter the German market is 47 days as opposed to 770 days in Poland, which is at the upper end of the spectrum. Similarly, Germany has the most products available in this comparison, with the next best country being Italy, with 129 available products. Certainly, the initial free pricing period in Germany is still driving pharma companies to accelerate their efforts to bring new products to the German market as quickly as possible. But what about costs, you may ask? Did Amnoc actually save money? The answer to this question is probably yes, but the costs for both patent-protected drugs and orphan drugs are still creeping up, seemingly disregarding the introduction of the AMNOC process in 2011. Still, it's hard to think of a world where the implementation of the AMNOC process would have not saved money, especially given that drug companies pretty much had free reign over how they wanted to set their prices before 2011. Professor Josef Hecken claims that Amnok saves 6.6 .6 billion euros each year, but bear in mind that that number also comes from the guy who's leading the GBA. So there might be an element of, look at me, you know, look at what a great job I'm doing and look at how much money my organization is saving for Germany. 
I also wanted to highlight some points of criticism. I think internationally the German AMNOT process is certainly regarded as a methodologically sound and robust HDA process, but it is also not perfect. For instance, one aspect that is frequently criticized is the orphan drug privilege. I briefly mentioned before that orphan drugs in Germany by default get a non-quantifiable added benefit rating. Furthermore, the orphan drug status comes with certain reliefs, such as not having to submit a full dossier, unlike standard drugs. This special treatment remains unique in Europe and there are some measures in place to tackle this already. For example, the reduction of the orphan drug sales threshold from 50 to 30 million euros. Regardless though, this remains a point of debate. Some critics also fear that the recent introduction of the 2022 statutory health insurance Financial Stabilization Act may harm drug innovation. After all, the law shortened the free pricing period and increased mandatory discounts and already spooked a few companies to withdraw their drugs from the German market. Then there is the Amnok dilemma, which to some extent is probably true for every HDA system. The dilemma is that the stricter the assessment, the higher the risk to deny access to important medicines. On the other hand though, less strict assessment increases the risk that the system funds drugs with little to no benefit, which is also not really great. Lastly, you can also criticize the AMNOT process for its lack of transparency. While the full dossiers and written communication all get published on the GBA website, the most important part, which is the negotiations with the GKV file, is closed off to the public. This leads to a black box situation where you do all this benefit assessment, you come up with a benefit rating and certainty of evidence, but then you don't really get to see how this benefit rating translates into price. If you still want to learn more about Amnok and you're not satisfied with the level of detail I've given in this video, then I recommend you have a look at the Amnok guidelines and templates. The key documents here to flag are the eQuick general methods, which are available in English, as well as the GBA rules of procedure, which to the best of my knowledge, is only available in German, unfortunately. If you're actually tasked with submitting a dossier yourself, then I've linked you the most recent version of the Amnok dossier modules in the video description below, so you can find everything what you need very easily. Since you are so interested in the Amnok process, why not learn how HDA works in another country? I've made a video in which I explain the nice appraisal process that talks about how HDA works in England. Go check that video up next.